Okay, so we're going to talk about this pauldron and how we got to this large detailed contoured shape. Um, ultimately, you start out with just a random scrap of really rough cut hide, and that gives you a bunch of the input details to inform your design how you're going to make all these sweeps and webs for this fin or uh, wing shaped pauldron. So what I'm going to do is show you how we got from this to this and switch to time lapse through all the processes. So ultimately, once we get everything sketched out and um, trimmed up, there'll be a whole bunch of texturing and wet forming that goes on. And I will probably pause once we get to the wet forming bits to really get the detail, but we'll switch to time lapse for the roughing out of the design. All right, so what we've done now is basically spend a whole bunch of time texturing the leather wing fin thing, okay? And we've cut out all the delineations of where our bone is, and we're getting ready to do all the fold forming to get it to a contoured state before it's laid over the body. So the first step is to re-wet the leather, and once you start doing the folding, you want to get both sides. Uh, because if you don't, <laughs> it's not going to behave properly. And it's going to be really thirsty, and then it will take a long time to dry. But luckily, it is very hot out here. And so, I'm not too concerned about the dry time. So we're going to get this thing sopping wet, and then we'll start laying down some creases to give a dynamic nature to this large finny pauldron. Okay, so just pick a spine. I usually start in the middle because it's the hardest to get to. And if it's stiff, give it a little more water. And this is, this reminds me of, you know, folding paper airplanes or doing origami when I was a kid where you're just really trying to establish that crease so that the next step has more memory um, as you go. So the interesting part about working with wet leather is it's very similar to working with what they refer to as leather hard wet clay, where you can do some compression, you can do some burnishing, you can do some sculpting, but uh, things can stretch and break <laughs> if you take them too far. So. We're trying to get it wet enough to move and be compliant, but not so far that it starts to stretch and tear. So you can see the, the material here starts to dry out as soon as you make it do that bend radius, right? 180 degrees, that's asking a lot. That's a heck of a U-turn. So we're trying to get that crease established and folding it between our fingers. And then you got to get the web space, right, the, the fan part, the thin part, the thin part to get out of the way so you can fold that bone up, right? And we can see it wants to crack up here again, so we're just going to keep spritzing. Just working, working those spines back up, okay? And then once you get those creases formed, you can start combining the two, and that'll form the bottom of your valley, this gap, this web space, right here. Boop. And then you can start treating them as one thing when you're doing all of your, your folding instead of fighting with it. And once you get down to these really narrow creases, you're going to have to come in with some hard tooling to really define those. So you can't necessarily get that with the Sharpie, but you may find like the back of your scissors fits in there or the tips of your scissors fit in there to get the line work there. So I work from the outward in because at some point you still need to mount to this, whether it's with grommets or with rivets or 
sewing, you're going to need a flat spot to do your attachment to another membrane, right? Whatever material you have, whether it's vegetable tan or oil tan, you're still thinking like, okay, at some point I need this sort of flat region here to attach to when I'm doing all of my assembly. So all these web spaces are just kind of ornate details. They give you a nice volumetric curve. They give you some body, some depth of field. And uh, then you get to that flat spot and you say, this is where I'm going to do the assembly bits. So we're just trying to get all these ribs lined up like so. So when we get down to these narrow regions, we can drop either a pencil or a pen in and bridge over that surface one way or the other to determine what's going on, right? So I'm just laying a Sharpie down there so I can put more stress in that region. And then bring that Sharpie back to the front to draw the line work out again. And it's just to give that memory, right? The leather's going to remember everything you did to it. So trying to get those curves in place get that well established and then work on the next region Establish that line. I'm gonna grab a couple of chopsticks now These are your friends. They just allow you to get some line work. Um, you can use metal rods, flexible metal rods, like aluminum would work really well. But usually when you're at this very convergent zone, you just need a couple of chopsticks to line up what you're trying to do. And uh, you'll find some work better in one orientation versus the other. So I feel for it, and then I use my Sharpie or a burnishing tool to lay between the two to define those lines. And if you find that you're marring the surface with your fingernails, don't forget to cut your fingernails. Um, this is a chronic problem when you're doing um, clay work. So you'll find that if you don't cut your nails short, you're leaving impressions on everything you touch and not the way you want it. So just trying to support those little mounds and valleys now that we have our rough curves formed and then we can really wet this last thin section here and give it some body and the interesting thing is you can trim these so that they're parallel but it's not necessary when you do this sweep you'll find a lot of this extra material comes in handy because you can just roll it over uh, jewelers call it I think a spiculum right where you're just making like a tapered tube of some sort and uh, oftentimes you can slide whatever it is you're trying to slide for attachment, whether it's a belt or a buckle or some grommets, you can fit those in the radius. So you still have that nice volume defined from the leather that you're working on, right? So you wanna get this volume pretty bulky because it's on the edge perimeter, meaning that if you're trying to do any attachments, it's usually gonna happen here or here on the tips or on the edge of the body, but no attachment's gonna occur here. So you can goof off and do whatever you want. But I found that these little light waves are enough to indicate you have a wing or a fin doing some sort of process or shape. But on these edge pieces, having that extra material there comes in handy to determine what, what curve, what sweep you want in the shape when you're doing all the hand forming. So. Once everything is laid up, it's really just a matter of finessing it into the final shape and you're done.